Hello again, it's Mr. Pete, your YouTube shop teacher, and this is tips number 575 entitled Mating the Rack and Pinion Gears Together. Now, this is the fourth in a series of four parts about rack and pinion. So, today in this episode, I'm going to tell you how to set it up, how to mill it, and make it into possibly a useful piece, although this is nothing more than a little do-nothing machine, to show you how to mate the rack with the pinion into a workpiece, in this case just a piece of one inch thick aluminum. I sliced off a little piece of the gear and a little sliver of the rack so that I could talk just a little bit about the working depth and all of that because we always get right back to math as much as you may dislike it but and, and I'll touch only lightly on that but the teeth must mesh not too deeply where they bind nor too shallow where there's a chance of stripping a gear or, or breaking a tooth off so let me show you the, the dimensions and way, the way to determine that other than bagasse and bagash. This is the whole series of videos that I made on this subject. What I'm talking about right now may not make sense to you if you have not seen the other videos, so check them out. There are entire books written on this subject and I'm just touching lightly here. Remember the tooth depth and I showed you that in the first video. And that's how to uh, determine the linear pitch, which is the same as the circular pitch, that is the distance between the teeth. What I showed you was a repeat, so this is new. And again, these formulas came out of the little black book. But the working depth is 2, that's a constant, divided by the pitch, and the pitch, of course, is 20, so doing the math, you can see that the working depth is 100 thousandths, and remember that the tooth depth was 108 thousandths. I ran out of black paper, but that is how to determine the minimum clearance. So there has to be clearance. The teeth cannot bottom out. And using that little formula, again with a constant, and then always with the pitch, we have 8,000. Now that's just a minimum clearance, so I'm really going to provide a little more clearance than that so that there is no binding of the teeth. This is the little black book. Remember, there's different versions of this, and this is the engineer's edition, and there are two pages here with all of that information. I showed this picture to you in an earlier video, but again, there's a little bit of clearance right here at the tip of the pencil. I thought I'd throw this little bit of information in here, and it's usually in all of the lathe books regarding, again, working depth on your gears. So when you're setting the banjo on your lathe up against another gear, when you're changing gears, what they're usually telling you to do for working depth is be careful not to get it too deep or too shallow and the gauge is simply a little strip of, uh, of writing paper so that when you engage it that is acting as a shim to give you that clearance. How accurate is that? Apparently it's good enough. This video, or this operation of fitting this up, really was more complicated and I spent more time on it than I did on uh, the other videos because there's machining here, there's a one inch bore that I had to bore out with a boring head, and there's a slot that has to fit perfectly so there is no slop, but yet there has to be a little clearance, but you can see there's very little wiggle and the depth has to be right. I can back that off. That depth has to be just right so that the cover plate here does not clamp down the rack and prevent it uh, from, from moving. So there's your rack and pinion steering and I put a little end washer on here and a collar to contain the rack. 
This is the original project that we did at the high school. I've talked about that before, a small arbor press. Now I haven't done any of this for over 40 years really, so uh, it took a little bit of a, a jogging of my memory to uh, remember how I did all of this and a little studying as well, but it's, just, it's very interesting to do. But there's a little math involved. Let me show you the original blueprints again. So that's the blueprint that I made up. I still call them blueprints <laughs> that I made up oh, 40 years ago or something like that. But zooming in on the rack, there's the rack. Now that's not the one that I made here in, in these videos. This is the, uh, the one I made at school that looks, well, something like that. Matter of fact, exactly like that. But remember, so that the kids didn't have to do all the math, I gave them the information right on the blueprint there. So they got the, uh, the information of the cutter size, the pressure angle, the pitch, the linear pitch, and the, uh, the tooth depth. That's for the rack. Similarly, for the pinion, it was also 12 dimensional pitch, 14 and a half degree pressure angle, 13 teeth, which means they used cutter number eight, eight and the tooth depth was 179 thousandths. And all of the math was worked out here for them as well, telling them to bore it out one and a quarter inch and that the working depth of the gear is 166 thousandths and there were the dimensions for them to do all of that work. And yes, there were a lot of failures on that. That kind of a difficult job for a high school boy. I know you're thinking, when is this guy going to start making chips? Well, you really need this background information before you start cutting. But uh, I think this is interesting, but I'm going to take it one step farther. And the reason that I cut these into wafers is we're going to go out, we're going to take a field trip right now. We're going out to the shadow graph and that will blow these way up so that you can get a little idea and of what it looks like and how they mesh and uh, the, the clearance. And any tiny imperfections here will be magnified because I'm blowing it up by uh, 10 times. Let's start on that trip. I'll see you momentarily. Okay, we're out here in the other shop at the Shear Tomiko optical comparator, which I like to call a shadow graph, and the one inch pinion now is blown up to 10 inches, so that's the size of a small pizza at Alfano's Pizzeria where I used to go. I'm not sure how well this is showing up, but if I can zoom in just a little bit here, you can see that the teeth are meshed, and right here is the clearance, and of course that's called the working depth. Very difficult to manipulate this because everything is backwards. Also you can see the burrs that I didn't get removed, the saw burrs. They would have one of these machines in the inspection department and they probably would have templates, very accurately made templates that they could, uh, which are like an overlay, and they could actually measure the tooth to see if the tooth was the correct dimensions. Enough of that. Okay, here's the game plan. I already cut this off to a working length and that is where I'm going to bore a one inch hole. So I'll rough drill it and then I'll use the boring bar, boring head with the boring bar to fit to the one inch uh, gear pinion that I've made. So I'll take this out now so I can use this as a gauge. Here's the setup for drilling and boring the hole.
I have repositioned the work into what I call a vertical position here. And you can see that the gear fits in there nice, the pinion. Just nice, really. And I already took a light cut off of here to square it up and just remove some of the excess. But laying the rack on there now, you can see that there is still a little more material that will need to be removed off the top. And I want, that's the very last thing that I will do. So taking that off, and this is a 3 8 end mill, even though I want a 1 half inch wide hole, if I use a half inch end mill, you know, that doesn't really produce a 1 half inch slot, and uh, it'll be rougher in the cob. So I'm going to mill this with a 3 8 and then later widen it with the same end mill to the width of half inch. But now, concerning the working depth, there's a lot of ways to do this, and this is not the way we did it at the school, but I think maybe this is a better way. But I'm going to mill back and forth, back and forth, until I break into the bore. Then I'll deburr it and start to take some measurements. But the, the first thing I'll do then is to put this back in after I get the burrs out. There'll be a big burr in there. And then I can start to determine some of the dimensions and how far I have to go in. And in fact, what I'll do is I'll touch off onto the shaft, and that'll give me the exact position depth-wise, and then I can get my working depth from there. I think that's a good way without doing a whole lot of measuring because I'm, well, it can be done with micrometers too, but I will just dial in the depth then with the knee crank on the milling machine. Okay, did you see that? That the there's chips down in there, so I have broken through. Sorry about that. I think some of the picture there was out of frame. But now there's burrs, and this is a one-inch reamer just to clean that bore up just a little bit so that I can get the pinion in there. Pull that out. From this view, you can see the pinion, the shaft there. So what I'm going to do is come in and touch off on the shaft, not the aluminum, but the steel shaft, I'll have to drop the table a little bit to do that, but then I have determined that I am exactly on the gear and I can then mill to the working depth, which is, I got to look again, I believe it was uh, right about a hundred thousand, so I'll be right back. Okay, the working depth is one hundred thousandths, but we have to have a little more clearance there. And remember the minimum clearance, I think, was uh, eight thousandths. So I'm going to feed in uh, a total of ninety thousandths. In other words, I'm going to mill that slot ninety thousandths more deep th than what it is now after I have touched off. And I'll take that in several passes. Here's how I am touching off. I'm right over the shaft now, so I'm bringing, bringing the cutter down until it touches, and I'm locking the quill. And I am zeroing the graduated collar on the knee. Now I want to get this out of here. And you can see I left a scratch on it, so I know I was touching it. Maybe you can't, but there's a scratch right there.
that's it I am down to the working depth okay the next step is I'm going to widen the slot at the same depth that I'm already at so that it is one half inch wide so I've already already done a layout on each side a rough layout I will mill close to the line and then I'll take a micrometer and I'll measure each side so that they are one fourth inch and then test fit it with the actual rack to make sure that it's a good fit. I'll work up to it. Well, I'm just about there. I'm using a caliper and an adjustable parallel here and I got about one or two thousands to go the rack itself doesn't quite go in but I really like to sneak up on a dimension like this because I can't put the metal back on Okay, that's it. Seems to mesh just fine. Now the next step is to take a final pass off of the top here. I'll deburr it and take off a few thousands and uh, then it's ready for the cap. Now here's how I'm going to do that. I've got the, the rack in place. I'm going to basically press it down just a little bit, make sure it's fully seated. I already checked to make sure there's no chips in there and I'll lock the quill and I will drop the table about three thousandths. I think three thousandths clearance for the cover plate is about right. I'm just taking an educated guess at that but I think that'll work so that'll be simple enough. That's it, I'm done on the mill. Okay, here's the workpiece right off of the milling machine. You can see I've got some deburring to do here and here. And there is the, the slot that I talked about. And I'll also run a file just a little bit right here and here because that's always a, a little bit of a problematic area in terms of burr. So I'll do that off camera and I'll be right back. We'll talk about putting the plate on here. Alright, it's been deburred and roughly assembled here. Now taking my calipers and this has become my favorite calipers to reach for because of the large uh, numbers on it. It's just a beauty really. This is just a rough measurement because I'm not sure if my calipers are perpendicular here. But I'm getting 84 thousandths clearance. Also I could check with a telescoping gauge the diameter from right here up to a tooth and get the working depth. But I think that's redundant. I'm just showing you there's different ways of doing it. This is the cover plate. It's eighth inch aluminum, one inch wide, and I've already laid out the holes. And you can see that's going to fit on there just nice. Now I'm going to drill these holes and tap them, lay them out, and all of that just a little bit differently than what I usually do. Normally I transfer them. You've seen me transfer them with transfer punches from this. You've seen me use transfer screws transferring from a tapped hole in the base piece onto a plate like this. So I'm going to show you a third way. Perhaps it's the way you always use, but it is the way that I originally learned on when I was 16. This is the Stuart steam engine model I made in machine shop when I was 16 or 17. And we had no digital readout. There was no such thing. I had never even heard of transfer screws or transfer punches till I was much older. We did not have them. Maybe they didn't, hadn't invented them. I don't know. 
but to transfer and to get all of the screws lined up you know in the cover plate right here and there are six of them and these six here on the end and then there are six here my dad showed me how to do it by drilling all the way through both pieces then tapping the holes then drilling clearance holes so that's how I'm going to do this today this has already been laid out I told you so I'm going to go ahead and drill these holes off camera on the little camera on drill press and that will be the tap drill size whatever that is I forgot the tap drill size for 632 screws and I always start out with extra screws because I count on losing one so if I need four I start with five if there is, if it just so happens that I didn't drop one and lose one, I throw the extra away. Why? Because I have 10,000 of these. Okay, here's the setup. This is a 3 inch vise. I'll have the vise on its side and I will drill all four holes in this setup to the depth. Allow plenty of depth for your blind holes or you're going to be disappointed later on. And since, of course, the thickness of this is slightly different than this, I use some packing. Then I'll take it apart, drill clearance holes in the cover plate, and tap into the thick block. Okay, now I can rest assured that all these holes are going to line up. Now I'll take this over and drill those four holes out 964. Now take the time to mark things and think about it so you don't grab the wrong drill and misdrill. You don't mind ruining this piece, but you certainly don't want to ruin this piece or you'll be pouting until next Christmas. And then these four holes, of course, tapped, what did I say, 632. Okay, I have the four holes drilled, clearance holes. They look good. And next I'm going to tap these holes. Now, why did I tell you to drill them extra deep? Because they're blind holes, and then we don't have to fiddle around with a bottoming tap. I can just go deep enough with my plug or my uh, taper tap and not have to uh, deal with a shallow blind hole. Plus these screws are quite short. It's what I had a 10,000 of. They're self-tapping too. Maybe I don't even need a tap. Oh yeah, I do. Okay, I'll finish those up and we're just about done. Okay, now let's see if it actually fits together or was I full of it on my method. And this is a method that I tell you, if you don't let the work slip in the vise, you know, it works every time. Now be sure and put witness marks on there, which you saw me do, so you can always reassemble it in the exact manner. Hey, I got an extra screw. That's a miracle. Now, drum roll, please. First of all, let's put the rack in just to see what kind of fit we got. Now, again, you've got to have just a little bit of a clearance, but you can see there isn't much one way or the other. Got a bit of a... So, so it's a pretty nice fit. Now, Will this fit in? Make sure there's no chips in there. And there we go. And it's not binding, it's going from one end to the other. Let me deburr it, get that die off of there and put the end caps on and summarize this. But first, a short story. You really have to work with great precision on this type of job, or it just isn't going to work. So if your name is Bubba or Melvin, 
forget about doing this. Now, why do I say Melvin? Well, I had a student in class uh, 40 years ago. His name was Melvin. Actually, that was his last name. He was, this was a beginning metals class where we used a lot of hand tools. This boy was so rough, so crude, that even the other kids uh, picked up on this. And uh, they call him Hacksaw Melvin because he used a hacksaw for just about everything he did. And uh, he would saw so fast and so violently that the blades would either shatter or they would actually fly off the pins, you know, and go across the room. So he was kind of an expensive student to have in the class. But I, I, for some reason I remember things like that and I had to kind of tell the other kids to back off. But it didn't seem to bother old Hacksaw Melvin when they made fun of them. But I had to say, listen Melvin, Mr. Melvin, you got a 10 inch blade. Take about an 8 inch stroke, not a 2 inch stroke, and let's cut at about, you know, 60 or 80 strokes per minute, not 500 strokes per minute. You'll get a lot more done. And by the way, put the blade in with the teeth pointing forward, will you? Well, there you have it rack and pinion steering. All we need is some tie rods and front wheels and a few other gadgets. And we got rack and pinion steering. That was stupid. Well, there we have it. Rack and pinion. This was a four part video. Make sure you have watched all four parts. This last one was just about fitting the two together, which is probably the most difficult part of the four part series. And you can do that with any pitch, any Dimetro pitch, any size gear. But you have to have $10,000 worth of equipment to do this. You need milling machines, you need drill presses, you need lathes, you need a lot. So, I did a $5 job with $10,000 worth of equipment. But, some of you might have found this interesting. In the back of an old machine shop book, there are about 50 projects. Here is one of them. I have considered making that. It's more or less a nutcracker. But I guess I covered it all in this video. Well, thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video series on a rack and pinion. And uh, be sure and watch my many other videos that I have. And uh, this is Mr. Pete saying so long for now. I'll see you next time.